السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته As every day goes by we find out new information about the consequences of the spread of the coronavirus for the health of our community and for the economy and many repercussions that will be visible in society over the coming days and weeks. In these uncertain times, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect each and every one of us. May Allah protect our health, our well-being, all of those who are ill, may Allah restore them to good health and grant them a full recovery. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our livelihood as well as our lives. Today let us begin by looking at two verses of the Qur'an in Surah Al-Imran, Surah number 3 of the Qur'an, verse 133 and 134. In these verses Allah begins by calling the believers to hasten towards paradise. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sari'u ila maghfiratin min rabbikum wa jannatin arbuha as-samawatu wal-ard. Rush towards forgiveness from your Lord and a garden arbuha as-samawatu wal-ard, the width and the breadth of which is equal to the heavens and the earth, meaning that the garden is as broad and wide and expansive as the entire universe. U'iddat lil muttaqeen. It has been prepared for the muttaqeen, the pious. So the pious ones don't work just to get to paradise. Paradise is the consequence of their struggle. Taqwa is based on ma'rifa, meaning piety is rooted in your recognition of Allah. And your recognition of Allah means that you will fear him and you will love him and you will want to be united with him and that desire to come close to Allah brings you as a consequence maghfira meaning that you are protected from God's punishment and that you will achieve jannah which is the receiving of God's reward many of you are familiar with the ahadith from ahlul bayt from Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam, from Imam Ja'far Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, that say that there are three types of worship that people perform. One is the worship of the slaves who are in fear of the punishment of their master, fear of God's punishment. And one is the worship of traders, people who engage in commerce. They engage in commerce in order to earn a profit. So if somebody is worshipping God in order to get to Jannah, that might seem to be uh, a uh, worship for profit. And then there are those who worship Allah because they find Him to be worthy of worship, because they love Allah, as the ahadith indicate. And a question that might come is if our imams worshipped Allah because they loved Allah, if they worship Allah because they found Allah worthy of worship, then is it a form of shirk to worship Allah out of fear of punishment or to worship Allah in order to get reward, in order to get to paradise? And if we compare it to human relationships, it might seem to be a form of shirk. So if I am kind to you because I'm trying to avoid a punishment that you might give me, or if I'm kind to you because I'm trying to get a reward that you might give me. Well, that reward is something other than you yourself. It's maybe 
uh, money that you're going to give me or some other benefit that you're going to give me. That reward is one thing and you are an other thing. Either I am developing a relationship with you or I'm using you to get to that reward. The same thing with the punishment. That punishment is something separate from you. So either I care about you and that's why I am listening to you or obeying you, or I care about the punishment and I'm trying to avoid that pain, I'm trying to avoid that harm, and you are simply the means by which I'm looking out for my self-interest. But that comparison doesn't work when it comes to paradise and, uh, and hellfire. And that is why it is not shirk. It is not uh, uh, contrary to monotheism to worship Allah for the sake of paradise or to worship Allah to avoid punishment. Because the punishment in the hereafter is a manifestation of God's justice. God's punishment is not something separate from the manifestation of God's justice. If I do evil, then Allah, in his justice, in his mercy, he will bring me to the natural conclusion of my own actions. And so when I fear the punishment of Allah and I do things to avoid the punishment of Allah, that is tawheed, that is monotheism, because that punishment is a manifestation of God's attribute of justice. And it is out of veneration for Allah, and out of respect for his justice, that I avoid his punishment. And similarly, if I do something for the sake of God's reward, well, God's reward is a manifestation of his wisdom, a manifestation of his mercy. Seeking God's reward is showing veneration and respect for God himself and for his attributes. So doing things for the sake of paradise and doing things to avoid punishment is doing things for the sake of Allah himself. But of course, there are different levels of connection to Allah. And the highest and the most desirable connection is to do things out of love for Allah, because he is worthy of our love and worthy of our worship, without thinking about what will be the consequence of those actions for ourselves. Not because of fear, not because of hope. And therefore, that hope that we have to get the reward which Allah has promised people who do good, uh, to avoid the punishment that Allah has threatened evildoers with, that becomes just a sort of support, a help for us to do the right thing, but not the reason why we do the right thing. And this verse has described that reality in a beautiful way, it says that you are hastening towards the forgiveness of Allah, meaning safety from punishment, and the reward of Allah, which is Jannah. But that is the consequence. Uiddat lil muttaqeen. If you are muttaqi, you are pious, you have knowledge of Allah, and you desire a relationship with Allah, then the consequence is that you will get reward that you will be safe from punishment. And then the next verse describes some of the attributes of the pious people. الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ Those who spend in the way of Allah, for the sake of Allah, in times of ease and in times of hardships. وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْضِ And those who keep a lid on their anger, especially in times of hardship, it is very easy to become irritable. It is very easy when we are stressed to express uh, that stress in anger or in impatience with other people. And so at all times, we have to be careful of avoiding anger, but much more so in times of distress. And other people also are going to be under pressure. And so I might be suppressing my anger, but other people may make mistakes. They may say or do certain things that are selfish or unkind or that uh, strike me as being offensive. So in addition to suppressing our own anger, we should give some space to other people, be extra generous with them. Of course, this applies at all times 
but in particular to times of distress. It's much more important to make an effort to be uh, forgiving of the mistakes of others and to keep control over our own anger, not give expression to the insecurity or the worries that we might be feeling. Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. And Allah loves those who do good. So Allah provides His protection and His blessings to those who do these things because they are muhsin. So taqwa leads to ihsan. If you are pious and you care about Allah, then it's not that you're just going to think about your prayer and your fasting and your relationship with Allah, but you don't care about people. When you are pious, then you do good. And of course, ihsan is a comprehensive concept, but the examples that are mentioned in this verse, they indicate that what is being referred to here is, at least in part, your ihsan and your goodness towards your fellow human beings. In times of ease, when you have been given much by Allah, and in times of distress, when you are facing difficulty. Now, it's common that when people face economic uncertainty, they try to cut down on their expenses. So maybe they don't buy uh, certain luxuries uh, or certain discretionary spending, which they had before. They don't go out to eat and so on. They might cancel a gym membership. They might uh, cancel maybe a uh, cable subscription or things like that. But one of the things that should not be on the chopping block is our spending in the way of Allah. If you make a monthly contribution to a masjid, if you make a monthly contribution or a periodic contribution to a worthy Islamic charity, if you are helping out needy members of your family or your community, if you are facing hardship, then rest assured, those Islamic organizations, those charities, those good works that you were contributing to, they also are facing increasing demand and increasing need of their resources. So it is important as a believer that we keep in faq alladhina yunfiquna fi sarra'i wa darra. It is easy to give in the way of Allah when we have more than we need. It is difficult to give in the way of Allah when we are in hardship. But in reality, the true character of a believer is known. The true character of our piety is known when we give in times of distress. The giving in time of ease is largely practice for us to develop a good habit so that we can keep it in times of hardship. And so if we need to cut back, certainly we can scale down, but let us try not to eliminate our goodness and our contributions to worthy Islamic causes. And that includes every Islamic cause, Islamic centers, masajid, charity, helping out others, anything that is done for the sake of Allah is Fisabilillah. It is in the path of Allah. It is in faq. It is an act of ihsan. So let us remember that charity, giving, is not just in times of ease, it is also in times of hardship. Let us try to cut down on other non essentials before we cut down on our spending in the way of Allah. And if we need to cut down because our income has changed, then let us reduce but not eliminate with the intention to Allah that when our circumstances change or whenever we are able, we will come back and increase our contributions to His cause. This was a reminder and one other hadith which is also relevant to this same principle. There are numerous hadith from our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and our imams to the effect that as-sadaqa tadfa'ul bala if you give sadaqa if you give in the way of allah then that will uh, protect you from bala that will protect you from various kinds of sickness disease hardship 
and uh, numerous ahadith mention that among the bala that is being referred to here is specifically uh, uh, diseases that spread in society and take the form of an epidemic or a pandemic. So one of the things that protects us is our giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is helpful to start a daily sadaqah if we have not already done so. And whatever amount we are able, to Allah it is the intention that matters. And so if what I'm able to do is to give a dollar a day, then I should give a dollar a day. But that sadaqah, for the sake of Allah and to help others to the extent that I am able, that is one of the things that we can do every day to protect ourselves and our loved ones from harm, from bala, from da or sickness, as numerous ahadith teach us. And when we are giving that sadaqa, if our Islamic center or an organization is doing so in an organized manner, then we should prioritize giving that contribution to those organizations because they might be better able than we ourselves uh, can do individually to find those who are in need and convey that contribution to them. So let us move from here to some of the questions that have been asked. There are a number of questions that have come to us, and some of them came uh, yesterday. So we'll try to address as many of the questions as we are able. The first question is that I am a medical professional who works in the ICU. There are reports coming from other countries who have been overwhelmed by the virus uh, that, for example, hospitals do not have enough resources to take care of patients and they have to decide which patients get care and which patients do not. Uh, and, and that might mean that some patients will not be able to survive. May Allah protect all of us. Is there any Islamic guidance on what to do if this situation arises? In general, this is a situation similar to, you know, if there is a shipwreck, for example, and there are two people who are drowning and I am only able to save one. And that has been discussed in Islamic law. The general principle is that your obligation is to do whatever you can to save as many lives as you are able. And when there are two, then you give priority to whichever is more important. And uh, in the case of a human life, if, for example, uh, there is one person who is closer to you, one person who might be uh, more uh, likely to survive, then you give priority to that person because you have a better chance of successfully saving their life than perhaps the other person. But uh, when you are in that kind of a situation, you don't have to hesitate and say, uh, do I you know, extend my hand to this one person, God forbid, who is drowning, or the other person, which one is more important? Both of them are wajib. And so in the split second, if you have to make a decision, then you go ahead and uh, do what you can, and inshallah, Allah will uh, provide uh, the ability for you to uh, save their life. For medical professionals, if there is a a protocol that is to be followed uh, to prioritize people who are able to survive, who might be younger, who are more likely to uh, be able to recover, then you can follow that protocol because that is not just an individual responsibility, but a collective responsibility. And our ulama and marajah have said that when there are regulations or laws that are passed for the preservation of uh, public interests, then we as Muslims are to uh, follow those regulations and those laws. That's the reason that, for example, we follow uh, speed limits and other laws that exist within society. So, in general, the principle is that you are to save both lives, but if you're not able to do both, then follow the protocols and uh, give priority to that life that you are able to save. Now, of course, this is a question which is most relevant to uh, medical professionals who might be on the front line. We pray to Allah that it never reaches that situation, but the principle is important for all of us to know. 
Uh, is it true that we're being encouraged to refrain from fasting to protect ourselves from the coronavirus? There is no specific religious instruction in this regard. The guidance that we have from Islam and the guidance that we have been given by our ulama is that you are to refer to medical professionals and to do those things that they recommend in order to protect yourself and others from uh, harm or from putting yourself at risk. So if a person is ill and a doctor says that it's not advisable for you to fast, then they should avoid from fasting. Uh, in fact, uh, if they were to fast when there is a risk of illness or harm or death, then that fast is not proper in the first place. But there is no specific religious instruction other than preserving our health about uh, fasting or not fasting. Another question is that hand sanitizers that we use contain 60% alcohol. Some of them may contain uh, a higher percentage of alcohol or a different percentage, and that's required. Uh, to uh, to kill the uh, the virus. So is it allowed to use alcohol-based hand sanitizers or would that make our hand nudges? There are some different fatawa of ulama, but uh, I believe we can say the majority of our ulama do not consider alcohol, especially alcohol uh, that is not customarily used as a drink, to be nudges. So in the case of Sayyid Sistani uh, and some of our other marajir, they do not consider alcohol to be najis at all. Some make a distinction between forms of alcohol and spirits that are consumed and, for example, industrial alcohol that is not used for human consumption. But bottom line, there is a minority opinion that considers alcohol to be najis. The majority of fuqaha do not consider uh, alcohol to be najis. Of course, if you need it to disinfect, then it is permissible to use it even if it is considered najis. But for those of you who are followers of uh, ulama who do not consider alcohol to be najis, then uh, hand sanitizer and other products that contain alcohol will not be najis. And so you can use them for the purpose of disinfection and your hand will also still be tahir. It will be uh, ritually pure. Uh, there's a question about the du'as of Sahifa Sajjadiya and statements of Nahju Balagha. Uh, we will, inshallah, be talking about some of those teachings of Ahlul Bayt and du'as that are found in Sahifa Sajjadiya during the coming nights, inshallah. Can we use khums money to, play, to pay for a Qur'an class which benefits the community? Um, khums is to be spent in accordance with the instruction of your marja' al-taqlid, the person you follow in taqlid. Because uh, this is, properly speaking, the property of the imam of our time. The marja' is the person who has the greatest knowledge of the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and therefore the most likelihood of being able to determine how to use those funds to preserve our religious identity and uh, our resources, intellectual and spiritual resources that sustain our community. Khums is not primarily charity or poverty alleviation. There is zakat, there is sadaqa for those purposes, and in times where uh, there is extreme need, khums can also be used for those purposes. Like in the current crisis when many people around the world are affected by the coronavirus, uh, many of our marajah have given permission to use either one third or one half of khums funds, the section the half which belongs to the faqih, in order to help those who are suffering, either because of their health or because of loss of income or loss of job. But the primary purpose of khums is not treatment of the ill or poverty alleviation. The primary purpose of khums is to preserve our 
religious identity and resources so that our community is sustained and when needed uh, it can also be spent for other purposes so the bottom line is that uh, in the spending of the khums you should follow the instructions of your marja'u taqlid one universal answer uh, cannot be given and a believer should not uh, make that decision just on the basis of their own personal opinion you can consult with uh, a local alim to determine the proper place to uh, allocate your khums obligations so i believe that is all we have time for today inshallah we will address additional questions in the coming nights i would like to conclude once again by asking allah to provide all of us with his protection and envelop us with his grace and his mercy. Let us remember that the things that protect us in times of hardship are to give sadaqa. So let us give regular sadaqa and alms in the way of Allah. To do istighfar. Every day we should increase the amount of istighfar that we do seek forgiveness from allah ask repentance ask allah to forgive us and seek to repent from our sins and our shortcomings in any case that is one of the highly recommended acts in the month of rajab and it is uh, also very beneficial in protecting us from uh, any kind of material harm or any kind of spiritual harm you can say astaghfirullah rabbi wa atubu ilayh and bring into your mind your past mistakes your current shortcomings and as we say those words let us intend to allah that we sincerely hope to avoid doing anything which displeases allah in the remainder of our life and we need his help and assistance in carrying out that goal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum Ya hujjat Allah fi arzu Assalamu alaikum يا أين الله في خلق السلام عليك يا نور الله الذي يهتدي به المهتد ويفرج به أن السلام عليك أيها المهذب الخائف السلام عليك أيها الغني الناس السلام عليك أيها المهذب الخائف السلام عليك أيها الغني الناس السلام عليك يا سفينة النجاة السلام عليك يا أين الهيا يا أين الهيا